Joining us now, Eli Stokel is White House correspondent for The Wall Street Journal and MSNBC political analyst. Also with us, Max Boot, a senior fellow for national security studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and a former foreign policy advisor for the presidential campaigns of McCain, Romney, and Rubio. Also with us, Betsy Woodruff, politics reporter for The Daily Beast. And so, Max, did I just hear the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee refer to the president as chaos after his secretary of state has apparently referred to him as a moron? That's a pretty apt summary of the day, Lawrence, I would have to say. I mean, you, what can you do except kind of laugh? I mean, this is kind of like a bad reality TV show. It's like, what the heck is going to happen tomorrow? I mean, it's any other administration, this would be unbelievable. For the Trump administration, it's, you know, more of the same, basically. It is. Uh, Eli, the one uh, reference in the NBC News reporting about this that I don't quite get is the part where it reports the people in the room to have been stunned when uh, Tillerson used the word moron. Uh, we live in a country where the le one of the least stunning things you can say about the current president of the United States is moron. It's something that's said throughout the country by millions of people every day. What's to be stunned about in that room? Well, that may be so, but this is the Secretary of State after a meeting with the president, somebody who agreed to go take this job and work for this president, uh, whose flaws were all but all known already. So, you know, obviously there's a reason why he's yet to resign, why he continues to stay in this job and subject himself to the ongoing humiliation of basically having no clout, of meeting with diplomats who know that he does not speak for this president, uh, and being humiliated by the president on Twitter at the president's whim, uh, as he was over the weekend on the North Korea stuff, uh, this is sort of a bad reality show, and we're past the scene in the reality show where both of these uh, characters have sort of talked to the producer off camera and explained how they really feel through their tweets and other comments, and yet that's, uh, they're still out there sort of, you know, the scene continues, and they act like they like each other. Rex acts like he wants to be there, even though he continues through our reporting. Uh, I understand he does sort of look at this, he'll be lucky to last a year, and so the idea that he's going to be there forever. Um, you know, the whole performance today just wasn't really all that believable, nor was the president's statement that he has full confidence uh, in Rex, as he said before he left Vegas. And Betsy, this is a president who has publicly attacked his attorney general. He's publicly, in effect, attacked Rex Tillerson, uh, saying that it, it's useless uh, for Rex Tillerson to try to do anything diplomatically with North Korea. Uh, and, and so, the, in a way, the, the, there's, a, there's an unsurprising component of this much friction between the president and his cabinet. Exactly. And this friction is nothing new. Remember, Secretary Tillerson refusing to disavow the reports that he called the president a moron? That's not the first time he's opted out of going on the record defending the president. Back when the Charlottesville events happened, Secretary Tillerson refused to defend the way the president responded to the death there and the ensuing chaos. That's something that was very much noted in the White House. Additionally, some of Secretary Tillerson's closest allies, his spokesman are Hammond and his chief of staff, Margaret Peterlin, have, have built up significant groups of enemies in the White House. They are not well loved there. And Secretary Tillerson himself hasn't necessarily done the work that you would expect from a Washington outsider to develop allies in Congress, which is why you aren't hearing many folks on the Hill, with the exception of Corker, sort of surge to his defense. Instead, we're seeing a Secretary of State under siege. And of course, the challenge for him is that he is he's jeopardized. He's put his entire professional reputation on the line to head to the State Department, and he's forced to watch state be just diminished day by day. It's, it's a really tough position for him to be in. That said, I think the reports are correct that it's unlikely he's going to step down or the president will force him out, if anything, because Secretary Price was the guy who had to get out of Dodge this week. So that seems to give Tillerson a bit of time. But Max, uh, to most observers, no one has done more damage to the State Department than Rex Tillerson himself. Absolutely. I mean, when I think about who has been a worse Secretary of State, I kind of scratch my head. I can't actually think about it, Lawrence. I mean, he is pretty much the worst I've ever seen, probably the worst 
of the last century. Uh, the way he's approached that job has just been very curious because he's been really focused on this minutia, like reforming the State Department organization, getting the email system working. And meanwhile, he doesn't have undersecretaries, he doesn't have assistant secretaries, he's not speaking to the press, he's not, you know, uh, taking a high profile policy stance. I mean, it's almost like his mindset is he needs to shed underperforming divisions so he can get the State Department stock price up. Uh, he doesn't seem to have much conception of what a Secretary of State actually does. Now, that said, I mean, Donald Trump is also to blame because mm -hmm. he is not a guy who believes in diplomacy, clearly, and he undercuts Tillerson at every step. But if, you know, if I blame Tillerson for anything, it's the fact that he has not done a good job of managing uh, Trump in the way that Jim Mattis, for example, has done a pretty good job of not getting on his bad side, but managing to steer him along and not getting implicated in, so, in some of the craziness around the White House. And Tillerson has not figured out how to do that. And I think it's pretty clear. Uh, that everybody understands we're headed for a Rexit pretty soon, that, you know, Rex wants to probably stick around at least a year, so it won't seem like he was forced out too fast, but he is not going to be long for this job. But, uh, Eli, as to the difference uh, uh, that, that Trump has, uh, the different regard he has for the people around him, it seems if the only way you get any kind of reasonable or, or possibly respectful dealings with Donald Trump is if you have the title general. Without the title general, uh, which Rex Tillerson does not have, he seems to be treated differently than this defense secretary. Yeah, the uh, title general or perhaps the last name Trump. But, you know, you're right. And Rex, we, this was sort of an interesting pairing. He was sort of entered the game late in the Secretary of State sweepstakes. He was sort of brought in and, and an unlikely uh, pick, sort of a dark horse. But he and Trump uh, supposedly sort of hit it off. But the just personalities, they are so different. It's not just that he's not a general. Um, it's, you know, this is a, a sort of underspoken Texan who likes to sort of navigate things behind the scenes, spent much of his career uh, at X on doing things behind closed doors and now he's obviously very uncomfortable with the public component of this job and you have Trump who is nothing if not a public figure who just lives his entire life in the media the presidency is televised and tweeted and that's really the presidency they just don't really get each other there's a, a lot of friction on a lot of policy debates pretty much every foreign policy debate uh, that we've seen and and it is interesting that Rex has been he's certainly not the only one uh, to feel frustrated. Sources tell me that even John Kelly has threatened to resign numerous times, yet he's still there, has yet to really, uh, to our knowledge, uh, incur the president's wrath, whereas Secretary Tillerson, uh, for whatever reason, uh, has sort of been in the doghouse, it seems like, for quite a long time. And, and Betsy, there seems to be uh, an adults versus the children uh, component to this. Uh, you have some people in the White House uh, saying they were hoping Rex Tillerson would leave. You have others in the administration saying uh, that, you know, without the Secretary of State, without the Secretary of Defense, uh, th this administration would be unthinkable. You have the Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee saying that Rex Tillerson is one of the people who saves us from chaos, the chaos, presumably, that would be visited upon us if Donald Trump uh, was, was given kind of an unfettered, uh, 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 you know, uh, framework within which to work. And so these, these cheerleaders, these anti-Tillerson cheerleaders in the White House, we don't know how many there are, there's only a handful of them quoted tonight without their names, uh, versus, versus the adults. What, what do you make of the size of those factions? There is a substantial dislike and criticism of Tillerson, not only in the White House, but also on Capitol Hill. I would say of, of all the quote unquote adults that we've referred to, Secretary Mattis is really the only member of Trump's cabinet who thus far has managed to preserve his reputation. The rest of the president's cabinet members to varying degrees have taken significant and in many cases self-imposed hits to their reputations. That said, look, it's important to remember how much criticism, how much dislike, how much Venom even is directed at Secretary at Secretary of State Tillerson, and in turn, how much his own staff are sort of s scratching back in a way that sometimes proves incredibly counterproductive. In the NBC story that ran this morning, R.C. Hammond, who is Tillerson's top spokesman, gave a quote essentially trying to throw Nikki Haley under the bus, saying that the only time Pence and Tillerson had a challenging conversation was when they were talking about whether or not Haley was doing a good job. Hammond later had to walk that quote back. It's just another example of the way Secretary Tillerson and some of his closest staffers have appeared to have been 
and working overtime just to make enemies. And I think that's why there really are some claws out for Tillerson this evening. Uh, Max, these two things can be simultaneously true. Rex Tillerson can be the worst Secretary of State in history, and he can be right about Donald Trump. Yeah, let's not lose sight of the elephant in the room here, which is that, you know, this was a gaffe in the Michael Kinsley sense, which is that uh, a, a, a gaffe in Washington is when a politician tells the truth. And this is an obvious truth that everybody acknowledges, but nobody says in public. And whoops, Rex Tillerson went, went and said it. And, you know, if you have to look at, at Donald Trump's job performance just the last few days and the way that he's handled Hurricane Maria, I mean, does anybody think that anything he's done at all refutes the notion that he is mentally challenged? I mean, who would advise a president with a wit of common sense to go out and attack hurricane survivors or to attack a mayor whose town is inundated with floodwaters? And yet this is the second time this year that Trump has attacked a mayor after a major disaster because previously he attacked the mayor of London after a terrorist attack. And then, of course, you had that uh, inadvertently comedic Trump visit to Puerto Rico where the where the lasting image from that is him throwing paper towels at the hurricane survivors like a trainer throwing fish at a trained seal and I mean it's just one gaffe after another or you know him going to a golf club and, and, and presiding over a golf tournament instead of working on hurricane relief and then dedicating the hurricane the the golf trophy to the hurricane survivors you know which is a little bit like you know Marie Antoinette saying let him eat uh, nine irons I mean it's one gaffe after another, and any president who, was, who, who had it all upstairs would not be doing this. He would not be getting, you know, approval ratings in the mid-30s. And, and the striking thing about the day is the only mutterings you get out of the White House and the unnamed sources group is that, uh, you know, is that we wish Tillerson uh, quit. What you didn't get from any of the unnamed sources is here's the affirmative defense against the charge that Donald Trump is a moron. Here is the case that proves Donald Trump is not a moron. We got silence on that front today. Eli Stokels, Max Boot, and Betsy Woodruff, thank you all for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.